The Charge Syndrome Foundation Speaker Series. Coloboma of the Eye, presented by Dr. Enialami Dosumu. So coloboma is an incomplete closure of a layer or structure in the eye. And so coloboma comes from the word, and it's a Greek word that means curtailed. So well, I'm going to take you back and do a little bit of embryology. When the eyes form and imagine it's starting from the top and it forms and it closes all the way to the bottom. It also closes typically, usually front to back, not always that way. And so a coloboma occurs when somewhere along the line it doesn't close. Oftentimes it's at the bottom. That is why when you look at children with colobomas, you will see that it tends to be down, inferiorly located. And so if you look at an iris coloboma, most of the times that's what we can see. It's inferior nasal, because that's usually right there where it closes. Can coloboma affect more than one part of the eye? You can. So you can have a coloboma of the iris, you can have a coloboma of the lens, you can have a coloboma of the retina, you can have a coloboma of the optic nerve. So many different layers in the eye where you can have it. So when we were talking about the different layers, I'll quickly walk you through them. So this is looking at an eyeball without the conjunctiva, which is the white that covers it. So it's, but the clear window into the eye is the cornea. I'm going to break this apart now. So that's the cornea. I'm going to take that off, and that's the colored part of our eye, the iris. And if you had a coloboma, it would be down into the bottom. And here is our natural lens. I'm going to pull this out. And if you had it, it would be down at the bottom. So you would need to oftentimes dilate the eye so you can see it. Sometimes if there is a coloboma, if the iris was still here, you could see the coloboma of the lens through that. But you would need equipment to do that. And then this is the clear jelly in the back of the eye. So that typically, because it's liquid, um, it's technically collagen that can then, then disintegrate. And then when you're looking into the back of the eye, you can have a coloboma that then goes, it can, it can sometimes involve some of the structures which we call the ciliary bodies, but more commonly it involves the retina and the optic nerve. How do various colobomas affect vision? So what kind of functional vision you would get in a child with a coloboma depends on where the coloboma is. So if it's only in the iris, which is very rare in charge for it to only be in the iris, your child may just have light sensitivity because you've got a bigger hole through which light can go in. Maybe they have some astigmatism if the lens is affected um, and moved. Um, but if it's in the retina, then you worry about where is it located. Imagine, this is how the, think about how the eye is. You've got this big bowl you have to look into and in your bowl, you've got a plate and then the edges of it. Um, if, you, if you only use the plate for really your functional vision or what you used to see, you'd be less concerned if there was a, a space down below because that would translate everything in the eyes upside down and everything you see is left and right. If it was a coloboma only down here, it would translate only to a vision change up above. And so that really wouldn't bother you. Versus if you had the coloboma in the area of the plate. So now when you're trying to look out, you're missing an area of that vision. So that would be very more visually significant versus one down below. And so where it's located and how big it is are probably the defining factors for how they'll affect functional vision. Colobomas can be very different in the same individual. So you can have one in one eye and one not even present in the other eye. And so the degree can also be different. You can have two in the same eye or you can have both eyes have nothing. So it's very varying. And so what type of coloboma you have and where it is is very important. So take for example, Jimmy has a big coloboma in his left eye and doesn't have one in his right eye so he would have good functional vision. And I'm sorry I just did that backwards because I'm always thinking about how it is when I'm looking at the patient, right? For me, it's always this is right for the patient, left for the patient. What other eye conditions might be found in children with charge? So looking from front to the back, cranial nerve cell and palsies. So if we cannot close our eyes, we are not lubricating our surface. So this whole time I'm looking at you, you've blinked probably a lot. And even looking at me, I'm blinking too. So imagine if you do a staring contest, why do you lose staring contests? It's because your eyes get dry and you have to blink. If your eyes get dry, you're not seen as well. And then you're degrading how well you see. But if you have a seventh nerve palsy, you can either not completely blink or have poor blink or have decreased blink and those can decrease how well you see. And if you keep 
exposing the eyes to no moisture, you actually can degrade the cornea surface and you can degrade how well you see. So that's one thing. Other things you can have inside the eyes that are not related solely to colobomas, you can have refractive errors. So a child may not have a coloboma but be very nearsighted or may have a lens coloboma and have high astigmatism and need glasses correction. So you may need to be physically in something to correct your, your vision. Other things are strabismus. So strabismus is a misalignment of the eyes. So you can imagine if instead of straight ahead, one eye is out, or one eye is in, or one eye is really high, and sometimes you may need surgical correction to get both eyes in the same direction. So at least whatever information you're gathering is helpful. And then the last big thing I'll hit on is cortical visual impairment. So sometimes you hear of children who have no colobomas but are not functioning the way you'd expect it. Vision is a beautiful thing because the eyes collect the information, but then it sends us all the way to the back of the brain because that's the occipital lobe to interpret what we see. And somewhere along the lines, you may actually not have the proper connections. Sometimes the optic nerve is underdeveloped in some patients. Some other patients have intracranial changes that can lead to a miscommunication. Or sometimes some other patients have other things we don't see on imaging, or sometimes you may just, you may have other changes in the brain that are limiting. Sometimes they could even be seizures. So I like to explain it, and some of my, my colleagues like to explain it, that imagine if we're all given 100 units a day in order to function, and I only use 10 units to stand, to eat, to smile, just to do other things, and then I use some others to do my higher order functioning, one of them being I'm collecting this information as I see, I'm interpreting, I'm looking at you, you're smiling at me, I know what that means. But if uh, you take a child with charge who's going to use 80 of those units just in order to breathe, and just to even function, then you're really limited how much they can do for other things. Or say an individual is having a seizure, and I explain it to my parents who don't have charge and say if you've had a really bad headache, sometimes someone could look right at you and you may not recognize them. And then you're having seizures, it's really going to be hard for the brain to really truly understand. And I always remind everybody, charge or not, as a child grows, the child is learning how to see. So if you don't have the input you need when you're younger, you're going to have a difficult time when you're older. So the earlier we can get input in, the better. So that's another thing that sometimes is not recognized with charge and we have to work on that. Other things you can see, you can see a cataract in the eye. So a cataract just means a clouding of the natural lens we have. All of us will, if we live long enough, will get a cataract just from age. I'm gonna pull back my prop and I say, imagine, so if you imagine with me, all the time, most of us were undilated, right? So we're usually using our central two to three millimeters of our vision. If you make a keyhole and you imagine, okay, this is all you really need to look through in order to see. So if, I, if, a, if a person has a cataract and this is their entire lens and their cataract is here, I don't, I know it's there, I worry, I follow it, but we don't touch that surgically because most of the time this person is like this. Now imagine at night, a pupil dilates, so if the cataract is here and at night they dilate and now you've got this in the view. So maybe during the day they're fine, then you may worry depending on their age and what they have to do and how much their vision degrades. Versus they've got this and this is right in the middle, now I cannot see it, and then that has to be done. So I say it depends, location, location, location is very important as to whether or not you do something about that cataract. Mm -hmm. you, you can see it in charge syndrome, so it's not part of the typical finding, but you can see it. Okay. And also a lot of our patients tend to rub their eyes for different reasons, and so just rubbing your eye can lead to a cataract, so we generally discourage that. Why is there risk of retinal detachment in charge? So the retinal detachments occur because of the col can occur because of the colobomas. So let's go back to the analogy about where things are located in the bowl in the back of the eye. So what happens is the eye is closing, and if everything closes in, it that is the foundation on which the retina comes in and grows. But if you've got this area, you can get a primitive retina in that area. But if you've got the coloboma, it doesn't really happen. And, um, I shouldn't say it doesn't happen, but the retina is primitive and you don't get the fully formed retina. So there are a number of different ways, and I'll talk about the two major ways retinal detachments can occur. If you've got the coloboma and right at the bottom of the coloboma, instead of it where you've got the area, the retina comes in and, and sticks down and then doesn't stick down right at a certain area. 
imagine with me, you've, you've painted your house with, with wallpaper, right? And you've got a little tear at a certain area. And then you, you, you're, 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 you're one of your children comes and keeps pulling at that area. You can pull off swaths of that, of that wallpaper. And so that's what we think of. If you've got this little area right at the edge of the coloboma, there's a tear there and it can pull off and it can affect your retina. If the optic nerve is involved, Again, analogy of a home, wallpaper, you have a pipe coming into your home and there's fluid going under instead of your pipe really wedged in and tied down so that it doesn't flow, you get, get, get fluid that comes through. So our optic nerve is connected to the eyes and it has cerebral spinal fluid. If you drop the pressure enough in the eye from rubbing or from other reasons, f the pressure in the brain may be higher, fluid can come through your optic nerve coloboma come into that area, push around the cold bulma, then get under the retina and pull it off. Those are the two big areas we, we look for. So if the optic nerve is involved, we tend to follow those children a little bit closer just to make sure if we see that starting to happen, we can intervene sooner than later. If charge is suspected, when should they be looking for coloboma? I always say it's never too early. Sometimes we'll wait till about six months, but if you can go earlier than that, Absolutely. If there is a concern that charges a diagnosis, you do want to do an eye exam early as colobomas are one of the things you're looking for. And even if you don't find it, and if that continues to be a concern, then I would consider a genetic diagnosis so that we know what pathway we're on. What low vision aids might be helpful and at what ages? There are many different low vision aids out there. The important thing is to find a vision aid that works well with the individual who's using them. If you start therapies, if you find that you need intervention early and you start it early, then they, they should match it to what your needs are at that point in time. Sometimes a vision aid can be as simple as a spare of spectacles. Sometimes it's bifocals just to help magnify, but you have to make sure the patient can use the bifocals. Sometimes it's a magnifier, but you need to be able to move the magnifier around to use it, or a telescope but you need a child who is old enough to understand, this is how I hold it, this is how I look around, or also has the ability to hold it. I love technology. And today, depends on who you read, they even tell you to introduce your children as early as six months to technology. But that's good because it can help us. Artificial intelligence can help us with a lot of things. Making sure the technology is appropriate for the child so that they can use it and not become a source of frustration. And then, using a cane, a guide dog, whatever, braille, and those are good too. I do always explain to my parents, if your child has functional vision and can see, I, my preference in my practice is to see if we can optimize how well they see, do everything we can to optimize their vision. And then I think of it as a second language or even a third, depending on what you're talking about. But I happen to have grown up in a culture where I speak multiple languages, not very well, but I do. And the idea is if I ever needed a fallback, I have it available. So take, for example, a child who has a coloboma, but maybe sees 2100. We can use technology in the classroom so that even if the teacher writes at a 2040 level, this child can magnify that to 2100 so that she or he can see. And then, let's say if they absolutely were ever in a situation where it's too fast, too much, then they've got Braille, and then they can read at a fast rate with Braille, but then they would never be in a situation where they say where they were traveling and they couldn't read the signs on the roads or things like that, because they, they have both. And that would be my best recommendation. Since you can't fix coloboma, is it still important to get regular eye exams? One of the things we have been hearing, while well, you have a coloboma, there's nothing we can do about it, and some families don't go back for years. I do know that the paradigm is shifting. I'm hearing these in more of my patients who are teenagers or early adults. Um, and then we, they come back years later and things have drastically changed and sometimes we cannot reverse a retinal detachment. We cannot reverse some, some changes from cornea disease that wasn't addressed early enough. As I would say, at least get an, a good eye exam at least once a year. Um, depending on what's found, sometimes you may need it more than once a year. But um, not to give up if the information that was given at first wasn't what we heard. Even when I look, I can never say. One thing you hear is you never judge a book based upon its cover. I take that and I flip it in my world and I say, I never judge 
vision based upon what I see because I've seen children with colobomas who have very good functional vision. So I can never predict. I can always guide and guess, but I've been amazed at what my children can see. For information and resources about CHARGE syndrome or to make a donation, visit chargesyndrome.org and click the links in the description below.